he felt like he was left with no protection. He started carrying a knife. And his parents were killed by an assassin, by the way, as well. Um, and he, and then eventually he got involved in the drug business. And then eventually people were paying him to go out, paying him much more money to go out and kill. And he says, yeah, at the beginning I had to get drugged and drunk to be able to do it. Um, but now I'm used to it. I'm cold-blooded and I'm, I'm used to it. And we started talking about the cycle of violence, right? Because he also said he doesn't kill women and children. And I asked him, but do you realize that, you are traumatized from the experience that you had that your parents were killed. And now you're doing the same thing to other kids. It's like, I actually never thought of that. And then he started talking about, hey, he really wants to quit. And he's been thinking, but he doesn't have, he can't get a job and all of that. So I think people talk to us for a variety of reasons. I think there's a lot of boasting, a lot of people that want to just talk about what they do. Sometimes their yeah. families don't even know they do what they do. I think in places like Sinaloa, where I've spent a lot of time with a cartel, it's impunity. They don't see a downside because the authorities aren't really going to do anything, even if they know who they are. Wow. And How do you feel safe in a place like that? Actually, I, see, it's, I sometimes feel um, in certain countries safer. Um, in Sinaloa, for example, if, you are, if you've give, been given the green light to go into the cartel, the territory controlled by the cartel, to talk to cartel members... Um, and it takes, you know, weeks, months, sometimes years to get that access. Once we're under their protection, we're under their protection. Like, we have their protection to be there. 